Mr President, fellows of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, sometimes I'm tempted to add paediatricians, but I'm not allowed to, uh, fellows old and new, and guests. The title of my talk, Science and Public Policy, Reconciling Two Cultures, contains a well-worn cliché, and I hesitated to use it. But clichés persist as memes because they encapsulate well comprehended thoughts effectively. Science and policy creation are indeed distinct cultures, each with their own languages, customs and practices, but the word that truly merits emphasis in my title is not science or culture, it's reconciling. For there's much about our future condition that depends on greater connection and connectivity between these two cultures. There are both real and perceived issues. In a number of countries, including New Zealand, increasingly effective efforts are being made to bridge this gap and to more effectively integrate evidence-informed advice into decisions that will affect us all. But ultimately, there are limits to how these two cultures intertwine, and this creates key roles for intermediaries between them. And I hope in making this presentation, the physicians in this room will see the analogies between what I'm going to talk about and the practice of medicine. Policy making and decision making are not the same. Each informs the other in an iterative ways and the roles overlap. Policy making is primarily a process of identifying problems and exploring the options to address them. It's ultimately the politicians that decide between the options to define policy. Policy making is really simple, but the processes provide the analysis and the framework on which the decisions about inevitable trade-offs have to be made. Most of the considerations policy makers have to take into account are values laden, and that's why politics is inevitably so contentious. The obvious considerations include public opinion, the electoral contract of the day, fiscal priorities, diplomatic considerations, and assessment of risk and award, both politically and economically. If policy making was simple, Parliament would be boring, and we could put a lot of journalists out of business, and not to mention the blogosphere would be extremely quiet. Some issues that policy makers address are straightforward and uncontentious, and receive little media attention. But many are contentious or become contentious generally because the values components are real and because there's no obvious right or wrong answer. Obvious examples are debates over issues such as taxation policy within the realms of fiscal prudence, the latter being a, fiscal, a judgment of the high values content itself, or debates surrounding harm reduction versus more absolute measures to deal with alcohol and drugs uh, drugs such as marijuana. These debates have a strong philosophical basis, which is, obvious, which is often too often reduced tritely to a unidimensional characterization of left versus right-leaning ideology. It's not. So where does science fit into all of this? Well, most obviously it is science that leads to the technologies that change our world, our society, and the way we live. Virtually every part of our lives, from what we eat, to what work we do, to how we spend our leisure time, depends on the fruits of science and technology. It's ultimately the use of science and technology that allows populations to be healthy and countries to become wealthy. It's the combination of the knowledge of science and technology with the values of the humanities that makes our advanced societies what they are. But if we look around, it becomes clear that science and technology are at the heart of the biggest issues we face as a global population, both as a source of the solutions, but also as a cause. For we must admit that science and technology have contributed enormously to creating the problems we now confront. The demographic explosion of a planet now facing an excess of 10 billion people and in some societies like our own, aging populations, rising carbon dioxide levels across the planet, the non-communicable disease epidemic, and so forth. This reality of how technology can contribute 
to our planetary condition is, has created some of the scepticism we see today about the role in society. But the nature of science has changed. While the change is not subtle, it's poorly recognised. It, it is a profoundly way of working and textualising the knowledge that science produces from the way we used to think about it. It's both about acknowledging the epistemological vulnerabilities of science and making a deliberate effort to broaden its societal reach. First, we, we need to remember what science is. Science is not a compilation of facts. Rather, it's a set of processes used to gather relatively reliable information about the world we live in, our societies, and ourselves. It's the formality of these processes that gives science any privilege and validity over other claims to knowledge about our world, which can only come from belief, received wisdom, or anecdote. When this formality of science is broken, whether by unsupported claims, hidden biases, lack of reproducibility, inadequate peer review, or so forth, public trust in science is harmed and its privilege is undermined. But maintaining trust is more easily seen, said than done. And here we come to a second feature in the recent transformation of science. Science used to tackle only relatively linear problems and inform society in a very linear and indeed unidirectional way. For example, antibiotics could kill bacteria, vaccines could produce whooping cough, clean water supplies could enhance a community's health, and so forth. To the extent that the policymaker needed science, it was uncontentious. It was simply information put into the mix. But the process of science and the context into which it's now applied have changed. This is in part because of the bioscience revolution that followed Watson and Crick, in part because of computational and imaging power that allows much more complex systems to be addressed, and in part because society as now demands solutions to much more complex problems. Now science must deal with nonlinear systems of immense complexity and often with a great deal of uncertainty. It may be about climate change or managing the balance between farming intensification and maintaining environmental quality or dealing with adolescent morbidity. In many cases, it's about trying to make apparently objective estimates of probability of risk when there are, inev when there are inevitably incomplete understandings of the system and with quite different understandings of the meaning of risk by, say, the actuarian compared to the general public or, in turn, the politician. Think how, about how your patients understand and perceive risk. This will depend very much on how you convey the information and how that, that is done depends on what you know, what you believe, what your biases are. But it will also depend on your patient's own biases and prior knowledge, whether that is reliable or unreliable. And underlying these points is perhaps science's most dramat dramatic and fu fundamental change, its integration into society. There's no denying that until recently, science has been patronising and positioned rather isolated from society. But in the very late 20th century, there was a broad recognition that science, like medicine, had to engage with and recognise that it was part of society and recognise the extent to which it was both shaped by and shaped in the social context. In retrospect, however, we can see that this initial period of the so-called social contract between science and society still kept science mysterious and inaccessible. Scientists were expected to produce relatively reliable knowledge and everyone else was expected to trust them in their quest. And somehow it was hoped that that new knowledge would eventually be put to good use. But slowly the science community has come to realise the mutually reinforcing relationship between science and society, and indeed the significant appropriate influence of society through the government, the media and civil society on shaping the scientific agenda. This itself is an uncomfortable shift in the balance of power that the science sector had enjoyed for so long, and was the shift that medicine itself faced several decades ago. 
but it's critical that the mystique of expertise is replaced by meaningful engagement. This is not an easy shift and is made relatively harder by the rather low science capital present in populations such as ours. It will be important that government, citizens and the science community together make real efforts to bridge this gap between science and society. In New Zealand, these issues have become part of the National Science Challenges processes, where we recognise that none of the challenges could be successful without a fuller social engagement from scientists and broader efforts at strengthening New Zealanders' own relationships with science and technology right from the earliest stages in primary school. This renewed and recast relationship is delicate. It can go well and it can go badly. If it's done badly, when science overstates what is known and does not admit to what is no unknown about contentious issues. But at the same time, it's made more difficult when the almost inevitable hope of the politician is for certainty of black and white answers when science can only serve to reduce uncertainty. Indeed, one of the biggest dangers in science-based advice, whether it's given directly to the government or to a patient in the clinic is not acknowledging the inferential gaps that may exist between what is certain in science and what the conclusion that is reached. We only have to look at the L'Aquila affair which sent earthquake scientists to prison in Italy, fairly or not, which was essentially the result of ignoring that inferential gap and overstating certainty and giving false comfort that there was no earthquake risk. The relationship is also mishandled when the science community assumes that science alone can make policy. It does not. Policy is informed by evidence, but also by those many values-laden dimensions inherent in the social and political realities I've already discussed. Finally, in this new relationship, it's also important not to assume that science itself is value-free, as it's certainly not. We do our best to use the processes of science to protect our results from the influence of values when we analyse data, but in reality values abound in science. So we need to identify them, understand them and ultimately minimise their effect. Values are inherent in what scientists choose to study, how they frame their questions, their methodological choices and how they interpret and communicate results. Managing and acknowledging those values properly is essential if science is to sustain its privileged position in the advice process. So how do I view the science policy nexus? Simplistically, it can be described as providing the base evidence on which to identify problems and potential solutions and then leave it to the policy makers to add the more overt values-laden dimensions. But this is a linear and outdated model. The policy process itself is an iterative and consultative process, and science has value at every stage in the policy cycle. Thus, the ongoing role of science in the policy process is critical and nuanced. Central to this is being clear about what is evidence-based and what is largely values-based. This is an important distinction because in recent years we've seen many examples where the complexities of science have been, used, have been used by interest groups as a proxy to debate something when the issue is really one about values. Climate change is an obvious example. There is a virtual global unanimity amongst climate scientists that despite uncertainties, the world is facing anthropogenic climate change uh, with certain and profound impact. There's of course much detail, deep debate about the detail and the pattern and timing of change because it can only be a predictive and observational science. In this uncertainty, there's opportunity for legitimate debate, but that de those debates have been largely displaced by using scientific complexity as an excuse for a proxy battle which when peeled away is really a values debate about the economic interests of this generation versus the next. Should this generation make complex economic choices which will have a cost but will benefit only the next generations, 
or can we afford to continue with business as usual and hope that the scientific community is wrong or that technology will solve the problem one day? Science can easily get damaged in such proxy debates, whether it's about climate change, whether it's about the use of stem cells in research, or fluoride in our water supplies, or measles vaccines, or genetic modification technologies. These issues are very current and not easy to address. Fundamentally, the role of science and that of, make, of making policy have two very different frames of reference, yet there is a need to interact. Increasingly, countries are recognising the need for intermediaries. The system of mediation may be advice based on committees, national academies, or on individuals like myself. The roles and rationales for promoting engagement through these different mechanisms may differ, but some principles are clear. First and foremost, the challenge is one of trust. The intermediary knowledge broker must simultaneously maintain the trust of at least four stakeholder groups, the politician, the policymaker, the public, and the scientific community. Each group expects something different from the intermediary, and the science community often confuses the role of the intermediary with that of being a lobbyist for them. This can have the effect of undermining the, role, the, the trust of others in the role. It requires a sense of accountability both by the scientists producing new knowledge and by policy makers and politicians who we assume expect to put it to use. This creates difficult issues of when scientists should act as knowledge brokers, such as myself, and when as citizens they act as advocates for a cause. Increasingly, this almost impossible distinction may need to become clearer if science is to keep its privilege and to earn the respect of the policy maker. There are obvious issues, such as protecting the independence of advice, acknowledging the limitations of science, and being clear about what we know and do not know. To understand that policy, that science informs, but does not make policy, and the need to ensure the honest brokerage of information. However, if these principles are followed, then policy makers will benefit from much closer interactions with the science community. A healthy society will need to use, to use much better the tools I've been discussing. The nuances and understanding risks and trade-offs are vital. The need to understand how to make decisions in an uncertain world and how to use objective evidence better in policy making is obvious. There are obligations, as I said, on both the scientist and the policy maker. And there are many analogies between what I've been saying and the conduct of your profession knowledge, values, expertise, expertise, beliefs, understanding of risk and trust are all intertwined in a relationship that has changed dramatically between doctor and patient in the last 50 years. A good physician is one who can act as a broker between evidence and the social, spiritual and values context of the patient. A good physician today knows that patients, their families and their social context must be taken into account and that the application of medical advice and knowledge over therapeutic options is more complicated than it was once assumed to be. The wisdom and collective pro progress of your profession has much to teach those of us in the science profession operating at a different interface. Thank you very much.